So why don't we get started? Uh, people are going to trickle in. I think we had like almost 300 people sign up for the event. So we're super excited um, to have on uh, yet another iteration of um, an Elevate uh, you know, career session. Um, today, we're, we're super excited to have on two fantastic speakers. I will let them do a quick intro, um, Tom and Liam. Some of you may have seen them on the investment banking panel where we had on 15 bankers a couple months ago. Um, but today's session is going to be um, all about now, uh, restructuring. So we have a, a pretty big agenda uh, for you know, everyone here. Um, we're gonna go through, um, it's gonna be very, very high impact for anyone who's either recruiting right now, anyone going into a summer internship, or uh, anyone going full time, or even looking at banking, or or even you know other related careers in credit and uh, and restructuring and distress, et cetera. So we have on our two rock star student leaders from last couple of years to to just you know go through all that with you guys. I'll just do a quick overview for anyone who's new to Elevate. I think a lot of you've, you, the folks on here, have seen us on campus. Uh, this fall, I mean, last fall or this spring, um, or come to a lot of the events um, with our professionals, whether it's in banking, private equity, uh, hedge funds, venture capital, et cetera. Um, I will share some of these uh, resources with you guys um, in a second. Uh, who's in the audience with you guys? 300 registered attendees, uh, 20 or so partner universities, about 55% diversity, 50 plus, I think it's more than this, partner clubs, uh, and obviously uh, exceptional leaders, you know, performers and individuals that, that we have in the audience here today. Um, look, for anyone that's new to Elevate, we are, um, you know, I founded it. So my background, I spent the last eight years or so in private equity uh, and investment banking. I started off, I'm Kaushik. I started off my career at Goldman Sachs and our investment banking group, uh, and then transitioned to private equity, vice president at Goldman's uh, investment banking group, uh, and, and vice president in our private equity group. Outside of private equity, I started Elevate uh, in 2019, so about two plus years now. Um, and it's basically a platform for private equity, investment banking, venture capital, uh, fintech, hedge funds, careers, et cetera, uh, built by professionals. So you will see sort of professionals, leaders on from a lot of the top firms uh, in the world. And uh, we're trying to bridge three main gaps. One is in education and training, such as events like this, where you learn about restructuring today, um, and plenty of other ones going forward. Um, we have a huge database you know, on the website. You can go back and check out all of our prior events. Uh, number two, networking. You know, I think it's way too difficult to meet, uh, too time consuming, too expensive, whatever you call it, to meet other people who share career interests. So we built a networking platform. We have a wait list. You guys will all have access to network very soon, hopefully, uh, and recruiting, right? It's, it's too challenging sometimes to, to find high quality jobs throughout your whole career. Let me turn it over. Hey, um, Tom, and then Liam, if you guys can just do quick intros, and then I'll let you um, share your screens and let's just dive in uh, to the presentation. Um, yeah, so, so Tom and I are going to give you like an introduction to restructuring, uh, financial distress, and then kind of a look at the different career paths that are available. Um, out of like as a restructuring banker, but also uh, like the different firms, who hires, what you're actually going to be doing, depending on the respective firm you're going to be working at, um, and then uh, giving you some examples of uh, questions uh, that you will come come across in interviews that might be uh, a little challenging, and also a overview of your responsibilities as well. There we go. So yeah, we have three sections: an overview of restructuring, recruiting, and then an example of how you'd spread uh, a capital structure as if you're at like a restructuring internship. So we'll hop on into the restructuring overview, which Liam can start off. Yeah, perfect. Oh, and also if you have any questions throughout, just feel free to use the chat feature and, and we can make this somewhat informal or we can have conversations during the presentation, um, but we'll have, leave time for Q and A, the more formal Q and A uh, at the end. Um, so restructuring uh, comes down to financial distress. So a company who, for whatever reason, starts to has the liability, the, the liability side of the balance sheet is exceeding the assets of the balance sheet. And eventually something will come due, or there'll be some catalyst where it will make the company insolvent. And all insolvency means is the firm uh, cannot meet their obligations as they, come through, uh, as they come due. So at that point, they're in need of restructuring. So there's different, many different ways of identifying distress. And especially as an analyst, that's where like you'll be able to add a lot of value if you're able to like search prospect for companies that are in distress that like your comp your your group isn't necessarily covering. Um, so things you should be looking for is just uh, upcoming maturities, uh, potential covenant breaches, uh, high yields, high leverage ratios, it's your credit ratings. So all these things um, will probably come 
in in in, cog uh, in the cognizance. They'll, they'll they'll come like alongside each of each other. Um, but uh, let's say, for example, if a company has a massive maturity wall in 2022 or 2023 that you don't think they'll be able to pay off, that might be something you're able to highlight to uh, some of your seniors on your team uh, if your if your group is not already covering it. Um, so the, the real uh, effects of insolvency um, when, so uh, Saad, you, you have a question by, what do you mean by covenant breach? So on, on uh, uh, and feel free to speak up as well, but on, on uh, one of your pieces of, on, on a term loan or a secured piece of credit, yeah, on, your, on a secured piece of credit, you'll often have something called a maintenance covenant, which essentially means um, a, uh, a leverage rate, like a debt to EBITDA ratio that your company can't go under that is tested on a quarterly basis. And if that, if your if your company exceeds that leverage ratio when it gets tested, then you'll be in breach of that covenant, and there'll be remedies associated with that breach that are described in uh, your your credit agreements. Um, but it's pretend, it's it's possible that this covenant breach gets uh, allows allows the creditors to excel, let's say accelerate their debt and it all becomes due. Uh, at, at the moment of testing, and then that could also for, cause like other forms of distress. Um, so, Tom, anything you'd add to that? No, nothing to add. I think you covered all the high level topics about you know what restructuring is, and then just one thing to call out is you'll frequently hear Chapter Eleven and Chapter Seven, uh, and Chapter Eleven is essentially a business reorganization uh, within a court. And chapter seven would be a liquidation. So yeah. those are just the two more things that I want to add. I'm not sure. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Uh, yeah, and, and th thank you, Youngman, for, for answering this question as well. Um, and yeah, so I, I guess we can go through the next slide. Uh, this is really just trying to like uh, exemplify at a really, really simple level what causes distress and what, 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 we, what we mean when we say financial distress. So let's say you have an extremely simple balance sheet and uh, you, you have a company that, that started that issues 100 shares at $5, like $5 a shares, and uh, they raise $500, and also rate, go to the debt markets, raise $500. So you simple balance sheet, you have 500 equity that's injected in the business and 500 debt that's injected the, in the business. And as a stand, as start, starting point, we'll have the gap balance sheet equal the market balance sheet. And all we mean by the gap balance sheet equaling the market balance sheet is that if you were to multiply um, each of the value, the, the value of liabilities and the value of equity by their market values, it's in, uh, it, it, it creates something, it, it essentially creates enterprise value and, and, uh, and, and that's what creates asset values, right? Um, so equity trade, that trade is just like equity trades. <clears throat> so you'll have the public markets, but you also have public debt markets. Um, and that's where you're able to find like the value of a value of debt. So going on to the next slide, we start to see how like, the gap balance sheet and the market balance sheet um, sort of deviate from each other. Um, so uh, the, the founder of the company, Roy Co, invests in high-tech masks um, by uh, buying a company for $300 and they issue another $300 in debt to, to be able to purchase that company, right? So a simple transaction that the market really, really likes. Although they're only adding $300 in asset value on a gap basis to the balance sheet, <clears throat> at the market, the, the market values the equity, the market likes the transaction so much, they value the equity at a much higher price, increasing the, the e box uh, on the screen. And as a result, um, in order for the market balance sheet to stay in balance, the asset value has to also increase, right? And we're also introducing on this page that there's different tranches of debt and different levels of seniority. So our first debt issuance is. Uh, senior to the second uh, second debt issuance and that'll be in the creditor and in, in the credit agreement that's stated um, one is senior to the other so now this is where debt uh, distress gets into, introduced so we have tons of mismanagement at the company the new business they pur purchased is completely functionless as, as well as their old technology their share prices plummet uh, below the value of their of all their life and exceed the value of their liabilities so you have senior debt trading at 60 cents and subordinate debt trading at 20 cents. So the market value of the debts are implying that they're complete, that they're very impaired, even the more senior class. So on a gap basis, we have way, the, the liability side of our balance sheet well exceeds the market's value of our assets. And when that occurs, and then that's combined with a catalyst that was explained on like the first slide, 
you're going to have to enter in some form of financial restructuring, which is where um, like Tom and I get and our companies get involved and where some of you will get involved um, in the future. And at the very bottom, on the bottom right, you'll see that we have an implied negative equity value. Obviously, this doesn't actually show up, um, but it's the deficiency between what we could sell or what, what the, the value of the assets could create on like an enterprise value basis and, um, and, and the, the, the balance sheet value of liabilities. It looks like we have a question from Benjamin. Do you want to ask it, Ben? Yeah, I was just a, a quick clarification. When people say like a debt or like a bond in particular trades at like 30 or 40 or 50, does that always mean like X amount of cents on the dollar? Yes. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Okay, cool. Uh, Liam, you good to go for the next slide? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay, so you have Royco. They're in financial distress. The value of their liabilities well exceed what the market value of their assets are. So what do you do? So it depends, uh, it's really dependent on the markets and also what's causing, specifically causing the, the distress. But the two main options, are you can do some form of out of court workout or you could go to a formalized in court chapter 11 or chapter seven process. So on an out of court basis, you're actually able to completely restructure the balance sheet of a company out of court if you're able to work with your creditors and um, they're willing to work with you to, 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 to amend uh, their facilities on an out of court basis. So firstly, if, if, there, if, if a catalyst occurs, um, let's say the subordinate debt in this balance sheet structure comes due, um, what you could try and do on a first basis is raise more money. If you have capacity in your financial documents to raise more money, that's like evidently what you're gonna try and do first. The, uh, equity markets are going to be very unwilling to let give you more money, and given how low your your uh, the, your debt trade your debt's trading, it's very unlikely you'll be unlikely you'll be able to raise any like junior debt uh, in the markets. So what's going to happen is you're going to have some form of like uh, 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 like equitization to, to the debt on an out of court basis, and if the, you're not able to come to a negotiation between your between the company and its creditors. You might even start an out of court process that leads to an in court uh, for formalized process. Well, so um, I mean, I, on an in court basis, what what could happen is you could actually prearrange with a, 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 an amount of the creditors on a on a plan. So if you have like over two thirds of the creditors agreeing to a certain plan, that but it can't get done on an out of court basis because you want one hundred percent creditor consent. Then once you enter Chapter Eleven, you can do something called a prepackaged plan, which is where you get those. To, over those two thirds of creditors to vote and accept the plan, and it crams down the non the non consenting uh, creditors. Um, so that's what that's 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 one of the advantages of using this prepackaged plan, which is just much faster. Uh, it's a faster process than just like a chip, uh, typical chapter eleven. Then we also have a chapter eleven reorganization, which is where you make a business plan in chapter eleven, come out of bankruptcy as a uh, same same business just with some, a new capital structure. Um, you can also have an auction or sale in chapter 11, which is where you sell the business um, in, in, out of bankruptcy. Or if the business really doesn't have any value and shouldn't, shouldn't continue to be a company, uh, you might have a liquidation in, in bankruptcy uh, in, which the, in which it officially transfers from a chapter 11 process to a chapter seven process. Um, and I, know I said a lot of words there that might've been overcomplicated or confusing. I think one thing that I found helpful when I was in your shoes is when like somebody presenting uh, potentially said a word that you didn't like understand, just writing it down and looking at the definition afterwards, or obviously you, ask, you can free, free to ask a question as well. Um, okay. It looks like uh, John has a question. Feel free to ask that, John. Hey, hey guys, as you guys ask questions, it would be awesome if you can introduce yourself uh, and sort of use it to also like network and things like that, right? So John, go. Yeah, I guess uh, going off what Kaushik just said, uh, I'm I'm a student at UT. I'll actually be at HL this summer as well, Tom. So uh, there you go. I guess my question is for a pre-packed bankruptcy, uh, Chapter 11, is it always two-thirds of the creditors that have to agree in order for a cram down, or does that percentage actually change? I feel like I've read before that sometimes you need like a higher percentage. Does that vary based on the situation, or is two-thirds just kind of like a, like a blanket um, number that you all use there. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I was just using that as an example for why you would, uh, like where you see common cases as to why you uh, people transfer from out of court process to like a prepackaged plan. Um, but do cram downs, yeah, cram, cram downs do uh, uh, actually happen. Um, uh, pre, not like pretty frequently, but like it's it's one of the main uses, creditors uses for, for going into um, uh, chapter 11 if, um, it, yeah. Uh, um, so uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be two thirds. You have to look at like a credit agreement to see what like consent requirements are for like different things. Um, but generally speaking, uh, any amendment requires like over 50% consent on an out-of-court basis. And then um, like any, any change to like the amount of principal that you're paying at the end of the period requires like 100% lender consent. So if you can't get 100% uh, consent at a court, which is like very, very common, let's say you get like 95% consent, uh, the creditors may still be willing to like pay those extra 5% off at par and then just do the transaction with the 90, other 95% of holders. Um, but um, uh, yeah, like percentages differ on, uh, on different, like I, different items of, 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 of distress. Um, does that kind of answer your question, John? And feel free to ask, it, uh, ask a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Looks like we have another question here. Feel free to ask it. Uh, hi. Um, first off, thank you guys for coming uh, to educate us. Uh, my name is Young Bin. I'm a freshman at Penn State. But um, so you mentioned here that you, um, so you have auction or sale as one of the in court restructuring options. Um, and so this is something that I've been kind of confused about for a while. But um, for a three six three asset sale, is that like a process on its own, or is that something that you, like a company is able to do alongside a chapter 11 or chapter seven? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. So essentially, when you go into chapter 11 or like in any distress situation, you're really trying to maximize and creditors are just, or and the company are just trying to maximize the value of the estate, right? So there's kind of, if you look at it uh, from a two path process, um, when you're in chapter 11, you can either try and maximize the value by being a going concern company afterwards, or you could try and maximize the value of the estate by selling the company free and clear of all liens, which is what you mean by a 363. So very frequently, you'll have companies that go and enter, enter uh, the chapter 11 process, uh, dual tracking, which means they're trying to sell the business. They'll have like an investment bank running a marketing process to sell the business at the same time as the restructuring bankers will be uh, formulating a plan um to uh to, to to reformat the capital structure and negotiate with creditors at the same time to come out of a bankruptcy um uh, as a new as, a, as the same business with within the capital structure um so yeah just to answer your question like very frequently you'll see people dual, dual, dual tracking the process um and tom correct me like if you have like if you've seen specific examples like uh, please, please speak to them yeah, all of that uh, aligns with everything I know. Um, I think if we've covered everything on this slide, we can move to the next. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so I, we alluded to this point during uh, prior explanation, but essentially in the capital structure on the liability side of, of, a, of a company, you're gonna have different classes of, of, of capital. And the more senior a class is, the like the more, the, essentially what, what it comes down to is who gets paid for, out first in like a, a liquidation scenario or, or uh, yeah, in, in a liquidation scenario. Um, so th this rule is called the absolute priority rule. It just means that all most senior claims must recover hundred cents on the dollar for any junior claims el eligible to receive any money, right? And that, that rule does hold true. Um, and because that rule holds true, you'll see senior claims receiving much more value in a chapter 11 process but it might not always be 100% of the claim um, for other reasons that I'm happy to speak to if people have questions. Um, but in terms of a hierarchy standpoint, your most senior claims are gonna be your secured uh, term loans um, that have like potentially a maintenance kind of covenant. Um, and then afterwards you could have additional secured term loans that are um, structurally or um, like, or structurally or 
um, just in the credit agreement state that they're junior to 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 another uh, to another tranche. So this would be your, your second link to mortgage or something. Uh, you could have unsecured debt, uh, bonds who are going to be junior to your secured loans, um, converts, and then evidently like preferred equity and then common equity is going to be last out. Um, so using the Royco example again, we had two tranches of debt. And under the absolute priority rule, uh, the senior debt is going to receive all the value and none of the value goes to the subordinate uh, lenders because um, it, 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 it's, it's beyond because the, support, the senior debt's impaired and they, they don't even receive 100. Um, so, so yeah, any, any questions with regard to the absolute priority rule? And if not, we're able to move on. All right, I'm just going to move on here. Uh, so now I'll talk about usually the two different sides you'll see in a restructuring and just kind of the two sides that a restructuring advisor could potentially advise. So it's the debtor and the creditor. So the debtor would be the company that's distressed and is contemplating bankruptcy. So for an example, very similar to what we had walked through before, there's a company that has an upcoming interest payment and it really seems like they're not going to make it, it'd be pretty common for them to reach out to a restructuring investment bank. So maybe in this case, they hire Evercore and they wanna try and resolve this issue uh, before it starts to kind of grow out of proportion out of court. And if that doesn't work, then they'd have to look towards the in-court solution, which Liam uh, went through before. The other side would be the creditors who they're just the parties that lent money to the company or the debtor. And if you're advising a creditor group, you're not usually just advising one creditor. So Liam before kind of had the spread showing all the different bonds or loans that are available. And creditors within one of those same classes will usually band together to create a group. And that group will go higher uh, an investment bank like Houlihan and essentially represent them in their restructuring process with the goal of maximizing their recovery. So usually when you're working in a restructuring deal, you're either advising one of these two parties, but there are sometimes other circumstances. So I just have some examples spread over on the side. You can see that these are companies that have recently gone bankrupt you'll kind of notice a key theme is that they're all in industries that have been dislocated. So with Hertz, that's rental cars and a lot of their business uh, was related to airport travel. Uh, same thing with Latam, they're an airline. When COVID strikes and there's no more air travel, those two businesses, they're not going to be able to service their debt anymore. And that's gonna prove an instant catalyst for a restructuring scenario. So I'm not gonna walk through all those, but that's a very common situation that how they start and then from there the two parties will have to come up with a solution uh, that hopefully everyone agrees on enough to get through the process so i ooh, yeah ask your question uh hey guys so my name is joel weeks and i just had a really quick question about something that you said on creditor advisory so you mentioned how they would usually all band within a certain class. By that, do you mean like the different um, levels of the debt hierarchy? Is that what you're talking about? Like one loan class would like band together and like, would you deal with different types of classes? Like would one bank deal with different levels or how would that work? Yeah, so everything in restructuring, it's pretty common, can depend on the situation, but usually I brought back up this capital structure slide. So let's say it's a restructuring. Uh, everyone in the very first bucket, the senior first lien debt, there's multiple holders of that. So it's not just one bank. Usually it's a, it's a number of them. It could be banks, investors. However, they all kind of have a very similar interest. So then they group together to hire a bank. And very much like I said before, though, there can be times where that group gets expanded into other things. I know from personal experience, sometimes we've started to advise only secured lenders, and then the group broadens out from secured to, okay, anyone that's a first lien lender. So it can really be pretty dynamic depending on the situation. Got it. Thanks. And, and Joel, ju just, just to add on, like you could have different banks advising the same class as well. 
Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and Ben, what it was your question? Oh yeah, so uh, yeah, just a little intro. Uh, I'm, I'm a second year student at the University of Chicago, and uh, I really like restructuring for kind of the blend of legal and financial expertise that goes into all the deals. I was kind of just curious about the landscape of like which restructuring groups in general uh, focus more on which uh, side of each deal. And I think we'll we'll touch on that a bit more on uh, one of the later pages. We can okay, for sure. Just show show uh, from back from. Thanks. Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit before, but you know what makes restructuring ex interesting and why you should consider it. So some of the things I like about it, and I'm sure the people on this call also find interesting if you've done research, is it combines a lot of different things. So finance, law, and then psychology. And I really think it's different in a lot of ways than M&A, even though the functional work that you're doing is similar in the sense you're supporting senior bankers through analysis and presentations. It's just that the context is different. So I had a summer internship in uh, a middle market M&A boutique. And a lot of times you're running essentially the same process for every single deal where my experience so far in restructuring has been, you might have similar frameworks, but it just seems a lot more dynamic and you really have to change your strategy as you go and new information is released, which makes it uh, pretty compelling for me. And then in terms of the responsibilities that you have, it can be, again, a little bit different than m and So I know from my experience, um, I'll start off with the first point I brought up. You have screens. So we were talking about Catalyst a lot, Catalyst for Distress. Junior bankers are usually the ones responsible for making sure that they're tracking those. So it could be a credit downgrade, by Moody, Moody's and then you see that and you have to create, goes on to the next point here, a company profile. Essentially that's just gonna be a background of the business. You're gonna spread its capital structure, which we'll get to later. Um, and just an overview for your senior bankers to see, is there an opportunity for a deal here? And the other two won't go super in depth, but you'll also have your standard pitches and deal execution. Um, Liam, is there anything you'd like to add? No, no, I think it's also like good to see that like, like Tom and I obviously work at different places, but the process it re remains re relatively the same. You'll have like a prospecting list um, and you'll have partners or MDs or even VPs staying on top of a bunch of different names and just being smart on those names so that when the company um, eventually your performance deteriorates or whatnot, we've already I maybe I've made an introduction to the company on the company side or I've, I've spoken to creditors who hold the debt um, and um, go from building a profile to, uh, to to pitching. But like the process is much more seamless than if you had no um, uh, had no prior, prior knowledge in the business. Um, but I think it's a, it's a really good, it's good over your, your responsibilities. Yeah, Sahil, do you have a question? Yeah, hey Liam, hey Tom. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, I was just wondering, I know you guys mentioned that there are some similarities between like the M&A work that you might have done in the past and some of like the asset sales or the process that some companies run. I was wondering in terms of modeling, some people that I've spoken to in restructuring say that there's less of a operational understanding of the company. I just want to see if that like checks out with what you guys have like uh, gone through. Yeah, I can speak towards my experience first. I'd say... I don't have really that much experience outside of restructuring, so I don't know exactly what it's like, but I'd say my work is really focused on the capital structure and what's driving that and the mechanics of it. And I haven't had to build an operating model or anything like that. And one of the main deals that I'm working on, we're co-advising with another bank that essentially is acting like a coverage group where they do all the work related to the industry where the role of Houlihan in that case and the junior bankers is much more focused on just making sure that the model runs smoothly and that the mechanics that we're looking at in the deal work properly. Yeah, and, and agree. Like I've never built in a three-stand model since I've, since I've started, but if, if you'll sometimes bring, like to run, if you're running a sales process or something, you'll, you'll probably bring in an industry group to, 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 to manage that as well. If, you, if you're, wherever you're working has like a, energy group or whatever they'll, they'll be brought on to, to help you with like the more of the operating side. Gotcha. Thanks. Cool. I'm going to move on to the next slide here.
Um, so the next section is on recruiting for restructuring. So it's important to know just what banks even have restructuring opportunities available to you. So we've just spread like 13 different banks here over two slides. We're not gonna go through uh, the details of every single one of them just because that would take a ton of time. But essentially what you should know is that depending on the bank, they might run a recruitment process that's specific to restructuring, or they could run a generalist process where you get an internship that is combined with maybe another group. And then only at the end of the internship would you be able to potentially get the full-time restructuring spot. And that's just important to know, like if you really want to do restructuring, you should probably kind of lean towards a group where you know you're going to be in that um, position for an internship. And it also is just helpful to know you know, if you're going into an interview, you want to make sure that you've shown that you know how that bank runs their process. Um, Liam, is there anything that you want to add here? I, I just, uh, somebody brought up the point of like debtor versus creditor um, focus previously. And mm -hmm. I think, um, I mean, if you have multiple parties advising, like if you only have one party advising the debtor, but you could have multiple parties advising the creditor from like an investment bank perspective, right? Um, so naturally there'll be more creditor mandates than debtor mandates. Um, but um, like just off the top of my head, like Evercore is essentially 60, 40. Uh, Tom said, who ends 50, 50. I think Lazard is very uh, debtor focused. Um, and then I would probably say Moles and PJT are 60, 40 as well, but I'm, I'm, I'm just guessing at that point. Uh, yeah, that's generally what I've seen or heard too. I don't know a specific breakdown and we do have um, just more, more banks here. Um, and if you're really interested, make sure to do more research because there are, even though restructuring is niche, there's definitely a lot of summer analyst opportunities. Um, I just want to see what the next slide is. It talks about career paths, but before we go on to that, I guess just general recruiting advice since it's probably coming up sometime in the next couple of months is restructuring recruiting is still similar to other types of recruiting where it involves trying to get in front of the alumni at your school that are in a position to you know choose who's going to get a first round at those banks and just conveying to them your interest in restructuring as well as cold out outreach so that's really the networking process it's similar to if you were recruiting for any other group. Yeah, so here we've just laid out the different career paths if you're interested in this space. Obviously, we've been focusing on restructuring investment banking, which we just spent the presentation reviewing. The next couple of things that you could look into either out of college, but more commonly out of an analyst seat in a restructuring group would be a distressed hedge fund. So these are investment vehicles that are usually taking uh, minority positions in a company's distressed capital structure in the hope of essentially profiting off that dislocation. And depending on the firm, there could be a variety of different strategies and a variety of different mandates um, and how they approach investing. The next broad bucket is distressed private equity, which is similar to hedge funds, except they're looking for control from the outset and they want to you know, buy the entire company. I'd imagine in the hopes that the business and situation turns around and it provides them with a good return. Uh, the next career path, restructuring consulting. So that's just a little bit more involved on the operational side with the distressed companies. And then lastly would be um, essentially distressed research, which would be very similar to equity research, except instead of equities, you're just covering the companies that are distressed in their credits. Um, Ben, what's your question? Yeah, so I can definitely see that, um, like, you know, I can definitely see like instances where distressed private equity firms who have distressed portfolio companies would need to hire uh, investment banks to do like debtor side advisory. But is it common for distressed hedge funds, like, you know, your Oak Tree or Silver Point to hire an investment bank to do uh, creditor advisory? Or do they more so just kind of let the real debt holders do that? And they kind of just like watch and see what happens on the sidelines to their investment? No, they definitely take a very active role. And usually, you know, they are the real debt holders. A lot of times, um, holders that don't want to hold distressed paper will sell to them. And those banks kind of in unison with making a purchase would hire a firm like 
Houlihan to try and figure out a solution and uh, essentially kind of try to control the restructuring process to, like I said before, maximize the recovery of whatever their, ever their position would be. Oh, okay. So creditor advisory could include like advice on how to like sell the debt to, to distressed funds that, so they could recoup some money on it. I would, I'm more saying, um, let's say after Oak Tree bought a distressed loan from another bank, Oak Tree then hires like a Houlihan at the same time um, to come up with its like restructuring solution or keep tabs on its restructuring process. Sure. Okay. And then John, do you have another question? Uh, I do. So I see that you'll have distressed hedge fund and distressed private equity listed as exits. Uh, do you think it's feasible? Is it an option to kind of exit into like traditional buyout private equity, or like a traditional long short equity hedge fund out of a restructuring like investment banking group? Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely seen both of those. Yeah, so it, definitely possible. Go ahead, Liam. I'll comment here. I think having seen this for multiple years now across all of our universities and banks in North America, um, it is definitely possible. Um, you know, I think every individual, right, if you think about your career, um, let's say you're going into uh, industry specific function or an M&A function, you have to explain to the funds, or, you know, if you're recruiting for traditional private equity, like, how will you take a healthcare background and apply to be more generalist, right? Or how you would take an M&A background where you've just worked on deals and not really maybe specialize in the industry and work, you know, go to a growth equity fund that might be doing technology. So um, I think the focus is really on getting on good deals, getting good experience, actually having an impact on those deals and sort of driving a uh, driving value and being able to speak to them in a strategic sense. And, and yes, it's, it's not like, you know, restructuring is also kind of a smaller funnel anyway, but we've had a lot of people sort of as long as you're explicit about it and sort of make the connection, um, you know, everyone has sort of strengths and weaknesses in the background, right? So you just have to sort of be able to explain why you did it and why that's taught you into going into PE. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so now we'll go over two types of tactical questions that you get in a restructuring interview that you might not see in other more either coverage or MRNA focused interviews. I guess for this one, Liam, do you want to do it where either myself or you read out the assumptions and then the other one answers? Sure, I can I can read this out. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so so yeah, so, so one, one question, I mean, I mean, there'll be a list of like additional questions, questions that you have to learn in addition to like if you're just like generally just like the banking guides or whatnot, there's a, there'll be a series of restructuring specific questions as the knowledge we've like, we've already spoken to, but you also have to answer like a couple math questions uh, focused on one, focus on yield to maturity for bonds, right? Um, so let's say Tom, for this example, which is laid out nicely in front of you, you have, you have, a, debt, you have a tranche, of, you have a bond that's trading at 80 cents on the dollar. Uh, it's maturing in five years. Coupon rates in ten percent. Uh, how do you get to the yield to maturity? Yeah, so I guess I think uh, this type of problem in three steps. The first thing I'd want to do is essentially figure out the current yield of the security. So we know the coupon is ten, so it's still going to get that cash inflow of ten every year. However, we purchase the security at eighty, uh, which implies a twelve point five percent yield, and then you have to account for the fact that. Hopefully this bond is going back up to par in five years. So you also get 20 points of principal, but since it's over a five-year period, let's just keep it simple and say 4% a year. Lastly, we'll just combine those two. So 12.5% plus four gets us an estimated yield to maturity of 16.5%. Yeah, that, that's perfect. Like that, that's like a perfect answer to, to this question. Like you'll, you'll, every first round, like restructuring or distressed, uh, interview you'll get or even like credit credit like like uh like anything on the credit side you'll you'll get like a yield, a yield to maturity question in the first round uh coming out of university all right i guess it's my turn here so liam given the following assumptions what are the securities in the capital structure trading at in year two so laying out the assumptions here in year one your ebitda is 100 and it's at a 5x multiple which 
the 500, <laughs> 500 of enterprise value. Right. Year one, also the capital structure is laid out. So there's 200 of senior debt, 200 of junior debt. And because it's a 500 enterprise value, we have equity of 100. However, the business faces some sort of dislocation in year two, EBITDA and contracts down to 50. The multiple still stays at five. Enterprise value is now 250. So I guess, what are these securities trading at in year two? Yeah, perfect. Um, so in, in assuming that there's nothing happens to the capital structure over the course of the additional year, you're going to have uh, a, the senior tranche, which is going to, the value of the company is going to exceed the senior tranche, right? So you're going to have uh, the senior tranche completely, completely recover 100%. So you can assume that it's trading at 100. Um, and then afterwards, you'll have an additional $50 million in enterprise value that's remaining. Um, and just 50 over 200 for the junior tranche, a 25% recovery to that tranche. So it'd be trading at 25, I mean, at, 50, at, at 25 cents. But the thing is like, there's gonna be dislocation in trading prices. Like the senior tranche, even though we have a value that's like well exceeding um, well exceeding the principal, like that, it won't necessarily, in reality, it's not necessarily gonna be trading at 100 just because like value is like, it's an art, not a science. Nobody knows what an asset's like true, like the exact number of assets truly worth. Um, and also in bankruptcy scenarios, a senior tranche might be somewhat, like might not recover a hundred, even, even if the value of the estate uh, ex exceeds, um, exceeds its cost value. Um, so that, like, that's, that's the answer. But uh, another thing I'd, I'd note is um, if, the, if there were like three tranches here, let's say, and um, um, uh, or yeah, if, if there were like, if, if the secured class was, was, was tied to like a specific asset and that's assets value was less than what the secured claim was, uh, the additional portion of uh, the additional portion is called, called like a def deficiency claim. So let's say that the senior debt here is uh, collateralized against uh, uh, an asset whose value is now only like 150. The remaining 50, so the 200 minus the 150, the remaining 50 is going to be treated the same way as a junior class would be. And that's that's called a deficiency claim. And that's just another question that comes up uh, frequently in these types of interviews. Yep. Um, all right, let's move on here. So lastly, I just wanted to include um, a capital structure spread, which if you guys, okay, before I move on, Jason, what's your question? Hi. Um... I'm Jason. I'm a sophomore uh, at uh, Rutgers, uh, studying finance, leadership, and management, and philosophy. And uh, I had a quick question on the last last slide for step three. Um, can you ex expand on what you mean by uh, the option value uh, for the equity? Because uh, I know you said it might not be worth anything in the market. Yeah. No, for sure. So that's kind of like, like if you looked at distressed prices of equity right now, like you'll have. Um, like a number of public companies whose debt's trading in the 60s, which implies that the equity has negative value as like we've explained previously, but you'll still have like a positive equity value. So for example, like AMC in the middle of the COVID, in the middle of COVID you still had a share price that was like above, let's say $1, um, but the debt traded all the way down to like 10 cents, right? So the, the debt, the trading price of the securities, of the debt securities are implying that like value of equity is completely, completely wiped. But yet for some reason, the people who hold equity are still giving it, attributing some value to it because there's still the, like the, the left tail or right tail distribution that says that this, there's a possibility that the equity could shoot up to like $10 or something along those lines, right? So people see it as like an, op just as you see, like, as you buy the call options, you could buy the equity in this situation, just as like a call option on the value of the company, if that makes sense. And let me know if you have a follow up to that. Exactly. And just to elaborate on that point further, a real life example, that would be uh, Hertz rental car, where essentially right when COVID hit, it looks like the business needs to liquidate. And I think an important thing to realize in this slide is that last assumption, the 50 EBITDA, five multiple, 250 enterprise value. That's essentially just an assumption at a moment in time. But as new information is released or a business changes, you know, that enterprise value could go up and all that residual is going to flow to the equity. So what happened in Hertz is looks really bad. The share price goes down to, you know, like below a dollar. 
However, the economy recovers and the core things that drives Hertz business, which is rental cars, as well as uh, they would defleet their vehicles and collect equity residuals off of those. It drove their enterprise value way higher than what the market was thinking, and the equity actually got a huge return. So it's situations like that, why the equity has value. And then Sahil, what's your question? Yeah, I had two follow-up questions. So on that point, could we also say that the residual value is because it would be like too expensive to short the stock to zero as well? So just because of that inefficiency, there's some value there too? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, there's, there'll be other reasons why like equity is not trading to zero, right? You okay. might, but, um, but yeah, option value is like one of the explanations. I mean, like, yeah. like arguments against efficient market hypothesis is like another one. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the second question was like, um, if there's a case where senior debt doesn't have a full recovery, would junior debt then also have some kind of option value associated with it as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so yeah, even, even if senior debt doesn't have full recovery, like although like the absolute priority rule is supposed to hold true, um, in many, many, many cases, like also, almost all cases, there's some value that's attributed to the junior, junior classes just because they can cause like a pretty big ruckus in court. So you don't want to just like give them, you can't just give them a zero because they could like bring up all these arguments such as like they could cause like a valuation fight in court or whatnot, which could drag on the bankruptcy process for an extra two months. And in those two months, you're going to spend $40 million on a lawyer and banker fees, right? So that then the value of the nuisance is like $40 million. So it's, it's the, you, you try and like give them some money to, to, to get them to, to shut up. Yeah, exactly. It's a tip. Gotcha. Um, Thanks. All right. So I know we're getting close to the, the end of the session here. So this was just something I put together to show you what you'd actually do um, if you're like on a summer internship. So essentially, you'd have to like spread a capital structure, which goes back to the company profiles that I was talking about. So I put together one here for Royal Caribbean Cruises. I've laid out the four steps here, but I'll go through them in the next couple slides. So the first thing, it's fairly obvious, but you need to just pull their most recent public information. Usually they'll have some sort of spread in their 10Q, but if there's nothing there, you'd also want to check uh, their last 10K. And essentially once you have the filings, if you go into the notes of their consolidated financials, they'll usually provide a debt spread similar to this. I'm not going to walk through all of this here. Royal Caribbean is a huge company with, I think it's like $21 billion worth of debt. So they'll usually bucket those securities into like broad categories like this. And essentially maybe your associate or analyst you're working with during your internship will say, you know, spread these figures in Excel and do like a liquidity analysis. And all that means is you'll have this and you'll create this in Excel. And you're essentially just reformatting it and making it look nice. And one key thing to know is that your total debt figure should match what is in the filing. And then from there, you can look at the cash on the balance sheet as well, just reading through the rest of the financials to see how much of their revolver uh, that they have available. And you'll be able to get to a liquidity figure. And then a key step that most people won't really think about is that a company has a filing, but in between filing dates, they still have financings uh, and they announce those. So the easiest way to find this is just on the press releases on their website, and you can screen for senior unsecured notes offering. It'll be pretty obvious when they've like issued financing. And then when, what you'll have to do is go to that capital structure we just had before, and you'll have to update the portion of it that relates to the financing. So in this case, I've added a billion dollars worth of debt to unsecured senior notes. Then you also have to add a billion dollars worth of cash to your cash balance. And as we know from the enterprise value equation, your enterprise value is still going to be the same as it was before, but your liquidity has increased by the amounts um, that you've issued those notes. So that's a common task that you'll have to do. And most people don't know about this like press release pro forma trick um, when they head into their internship. Um, okay, let's keep going. Uh, questions. Um, can you guys hang on for a couple of minutes and take questions, Liam, uh, Tom? Okay, cool. So let's go to Arman. 
Awesome. Thanks, Garshik. And thanks to Tom and Liam. I think that session was very useful for all the students here. So appreciate you guys taking a time out here. Uh, I guess my question is just relating to how the banks kind of uh, set out the fees for these types of transactions. So obviously there's a lot of uncertainty associated, like especially with the creditor side. So are there generally like ongoing advisory fees and then kind of like more related to success fees with these transactions? Or is it more so just on the point of like actual reorganization or, you know, an endpoint result that drives the fees for, for the firms? Uh, I can take this first, at least from what I've seen, there's always um, for the deals that I'm on a monthly retainer that Houlihan gets paid as well as a success fee. And then the engagement letter, which is the document between the advisor and the client usually covers a spectrum of outcomes. So in one of the deals I'm working on, it's not just if our specific scenario is successful, but if a range of potential scenarios, whether it's a restructuring, a joint venture, all these different things, that's going to be covered. And each of those will have a different corresponding success fee. Okay, exactly. It's the same across the, the other banks. Great. Thanks. Yep. Um, I, I'm Canadian as well. I went to, uh, I'm from Ottawa. So I, I went to Western. Um, so like most of the boutiques are pretty, pretty helpful. Uh, I would say I'm looking at the list right now on my screen. Um, bunch of, bunch of guys, like a bunch of people I know work at Google Hand, um, Mollis, um, yeah, Green Hill. Um, but yeah, they get, it, it's definitely, it's definitely like difficult um, and to be, like a conversation that like has like you'll have an interview, but I would say go, go ahead and ask your follow up. You can try there. Alvin and then Young Bin, and I think we'll just do two questions to be cognizant of people's times. Yeah. Um. Well, thanks for holding the panel. I'm Alvin. I'm a sophomore at UNC. Uh, nice to see you again, Tom. Um. But one question I was having was essentially, um, I got the idea from a presentation that you guys kind of um get staffed on whatever deals come up. Um. As an analyst, I'm just wondering, like, is there a point? Uh, when you start to silo off into a specific area of restructuring, like um, creditor and debtor side, or like a specific industry, or is it just like you remain a generalist throughout your career? At least for me, I think at the junior level, it's really dependent on whatever deals the senior bankers bring in and whatever industries that they kind of carved out their own niche. You know, you're probably going to do a lot of deals in that space, and it's not till maybe you get past the associate level or potentially even vice president level that you kind of carve out your own niche. I think like anything, it's going to depend on the situation. I, I, yeah. I think, I think like people stay relatively industry agnostic throughout their career. Um, but you'll have like partners who have like really great relationships with like CLOs and like specific credit, like specific credit funds or, or whatnot. Um, so they'll maybe bring in like more, Credit, creditor mandates uh, and whatnot. But a lot of the time, like the, the, the debtor stuff is, is driven uh, by the firm's industry groups. Um, so that, that'll just get spread throughout. But go ahead, Alvin. But I do want to take the time out to thank um, Liam and Tom for just an ex excellent presentation today. Um, look, I think, you know, they're exceptional leaders, you know, over the past couple of years in college and now uh, you know, as, as bankers, obviously they're extremely knowledgeable, they're rock stars at the places they're at, um, you know, but beyond that, right, they are, um, you know, exceptional mentors, right, taking out time for our Elevate platform to come back and, and sort of educate the next generation of individuals. And so I do want to take the time out for them putting in the time and thought and effort into the presentation to educate all of us here. Um, so, you know, please appreciate them for, for, you know, doing that. To mimic everyone said, you know, thank you guys so much. Um, quick question. So one commonly referred to book for learning about restructuring is Distressed Analysis by Moyer. Um, are there any other books or resources that you guys personally enjoyed reading or recommend to us to learn more about restructuring? Yeah, there's a ton of um, resources online. Like if you just type in anything restructuring related, I know in a recently a book came out, I believe it's called something along the lines of Caesar's Palace, and it goes through the whole Caesar's Palace um, bankruptcy and restructuring. So that's one of them. There's also books called like 
leverage financed handbooks uh, and just kind of a variety of restructuring books, which you can find on Amazon. Thank you guys so much. Again, I think we just have to give a virtual round of applause to our uh, amazing panelists here. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you guys all so much. And, you know, all of our students, obviously, for uh, being passionate about this and, uh, and sort of wanting to learn more. Um, so yeah, on that note, uh, thank you guys, Liam, from my, my end and the Elevate Team's end uh, for being on. And, uh, you know, best of luck to everyone in the recruiting process. Um, you know, we will share this in the slides as well. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we have also like 500 videos online. So if you guys want to go and, and learn from other professionals, you know, for the recruiting process, a lot of this is just knowing the right information and acting upon it. Um, and so on that note, thank you guys so much and, uh, wish everyone a great rest of the Sunday. All right. Bye guys. Bye. See you guys. Yeah. Thank you guys.